Get started. Welcome everybody. I'm David Weil from the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. This is both your host and the man behind the scenes running the technology. So bear with me if it's a little bumpy here or there. But I want to welcome you all to the Arts and Medicine. And uh, we're having uh, a wonderful presentation today, examining bioethical dimensions of art with Elizabeth Armstrong and Romel. And I want to uh, introduce them to you, and then I'll let them take the show away. Um, Elizabeth uh, teaches the capstone bioethics class for students at the School of Science and Engineering at Colorado Christian University. And her books include ethics of pharmaceutical and surgical device pricing, ethics and bias in artificial intelligence, in healthcare applications, neuroethics, and computer human interfaces, as well as justice for special populations in medicine. Um, so is earning a doctorate in bioethics and health policy at Loyola University in Chicago, my hometown. And uh, she holds a master's from Columbia University and graduated with honors from Colorado Christian University, where she earned degrees in political science and philosophy. And in her spare time, uh, she serves on multiple ethics committees in the metro area and volunteers as a court appointed special advocate. Well, as an abstract painter and a mural artist hailing from Detroit and now based in Denver, her colorful energetic work, which you saw in the flyers, uh, explores modalities of healing with color and connection the artist has to cities in the world in which she's lived. A period of time spent in Detroit marked Romel's introduction to the rigor of the studio and inspired her 2016 solo show, Through Healing, where she used new materials to explore how art can heal on a personal and community scale during her residency at Pony Ride, Denver. Romel continues to work out of her art studio in Denver, where she also serves as the creator direct, creative director of Babe Walls Mural Festival, supporting an all women and non-binary artist roster. So I'm sure this is going to be an interesting talk for us all. We are recording this uh, for the future and will be on our website. And if you could use the chat function to ask your questions, we'll leave time at the end to uh, incorporate that in the discussion. So thank you and uh, take it away. Wonderful, okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming. We're so happy to have you as guests and participants today. Um, I'm Elizabeth, Ramel is the, the other person on camera right now. Really fast, I'd love to give us kind of an agenda so that you can see sort of where we're gonna go with this talk. We'll discuss the goal, kind of how we developed this framework for uh, interacting with and understanding different bioethical dimensions of a visual artwork. The process, how you can do it for yourself, um, take you through two case studies of some of our favorite works and then do any Q&A that you might have or also comments. Um, something that we noted uh, as, as we practice this presentation and um, we gave it to some guests a little bit earlier is uh, some people surfaced real insights uh, about different works as we did the presentation. So we'd love to hear anything um, that you're noticing or any curiosities you may have uh, with the works as we present. Okay. So our goal today is to offer an initial framework for how to interact and examine bioethical dimensions of art and pain. So kind of just to frame this up, there's this really great quote from Dr. Sheehan. Um, Emotions are clearly the stuff of ethics in an important respect, glossing over some important distinctions in moral philosophy. The passions, our emotions, attitudes, and desires make ethical issues and choices things that we care about. Um, for those of you who, who may not be as familiar with the use of visual art in medicine or, or may not have uh, worked with art in, in medicine or a clinical context, there's a lot of data that suggests that art um, can improve clinical skills like observation and reflective thinking, can promote understanding, increase resilience, 
um, and enhance patient care and consideration. So knowing all of these things, as a bioethicist, I was really always very eager to want to interact with different visual work, see what I can unlock about the world and patients that I might not know from my experience or my studies. But it can be a little bit challenging to know where to start. Um, and so that's that's why Ramel and I kind of sat down um, her as a as a um, an expert in art here in the Denver area um, to think about you know how do we engage with the work how do we get the most out of it how do we understand um, what kind of dilemmas or challenges an artist might be surfacing about pain or um, social values or justice in our uh, communities and societies. So um, that's kind of uh, what we're doing today is, is sort of presenting this framework um, with the humility around this is an initial framework. These are just questions we would begin by asking when you're, when you're encountering a work, you might spend more time on some of them and not others. But I think one of the key factors of this presentation um, is really to, to take what serves you um, as far as interacting with a work. So one of the key things Ramel and I uh, talked about, and Ramel, I'm, I'm really excited for you to chime in here, because for me and my brain, I always want to, to kind of define things and, and make sure I'm understanding things in, a, in, in the way maybe the artist intended or um, sort of perceive it the, the way it's been written about. But it, it always raises this question for me of, is there a wrong way to understand art? What do you think about that? So I think with that, it's important from the beginning just to understand that even even people like myself who have gone to art school and are practicing artists face the same question of being in this moment, looking at artwork and feeling like there's no way you can gather a full understanding of artwork or a piece, no matter if you're in a museum or visiting an artist studio. It's a super common emotion to have that initial feeling of questioning it. But um, just to go back to the idea and the concept of understanding art, I think um, at least from my own perspective, I don't think there is a wrong way to understand it as long as you're coming at it with an open mind and realizing that there is, there's multiple ways of interpreting what an artist has made. And so many of these things can be unpacked into what the context is emotionally through, you know, maybe where the artist is from, the materials they're using the era of which they're making work, all of this goes into informing our process and our experience when we're looking at work and unpacking it. But ultimately, there's no wrong way to do it. I think it's just being able to take a step back and, and encourage yourself to have an open mind going into um, kind of what we're going to unpack here today. Yeah. It's interesting to me because I know we're seeing kind of a surge in burnout, especially with clinicians physically and emotionally, um, empathy fatigue, moral distress. And so sometimes I think it, it sounds like the, the only wrong way to understand art would be to not to not try to understand it, to not try and approach it. And I think it's hard when there when there is that kind of that burnout right now, but but art can actually give us kind of a tool and maybe an antidote to to sort of address some of that burnout. Mm -hmm. And I think too, even looking at what the previous screen of um, mm -hmm. the work by Beverly Fishman, the abstract work, um, you know, we see a lot of that in unpacking works that are abstract. You might not initially understand what it means, but, um, you know, for example, through a title, you'll be able to learn that it is in fact about, um, there's a reference to pharmaceuticals. Um, and then same with mm -hmm. Alicia Cardenas, who's on the screen as well. Her work was about, um, she, you know, she's, she was a tattooer and a lot of her work ties into her culture, her identity. So being able to look at the work kind of in through the lens of um, using these clues, I think is a, a really important part of understanding something to, you don't necessarily have to know what everything is about, but by using these, these clues, we can, we can kind of help ourselves out along the way. Mm -hmm. To do that, yeah, do that work. One of the things that, you know, is, as we, as we talked about this, that you surfaced that I thought was really interesting is considering the dual role of art, like on this screen, um, we kind of got a, a work of art as kind of like a history marker, you know, Titian and the Pieta kind of um, uh, marking the, the challenges surrounding the plague in the 1500s. And, and, and Titian, we know, actually ended up succumbing to that. And then we have art kind of um, in the right, not only is, um, you know, we've got the statue of the Robert E. Lee, um, the general in the back, not only as history maker, but art as activism and advocacy. 
um, and that that there's this dual context that we can we can um, examine when we approach art. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking at the image on the right, this was a photograph taken during the BLM movement um, during during the summer of those protests in 2020. So what's really interesting, like Elizabeth said, is there's this layering of art and artifacts within this image. You know, mm -hmm. you have this historical sculpture in a way um, that represents a certain time and place and even belief system. And you have um, the artist Clifford Chambliss III with his poster. And, um, you know, I, I think that's a really interesting layering of sort of this context, but also creating through this photograph, a new meaning of what uh, what the artist is going for and what what it is they're trying to say and further what are they trying to um, to prove and to preserve through the work and through the through the words um, specifically on on this poster. Yeah, I think with these works, you know, we can surface um, different commentary from both of these artists about um, maybe justice or equity or well being um, or or duty. Um, and so all of these features, right, we've talked about are kind of, you know, context of like, these are things that we ought to know when we approach art. It can be um, activist, it can be history marker, it can be both, it can surface different challenges. But I think something we're trying to really get at today is this, um, this emotional context and where that intersects with the features of the work. Could you speak to engaging um, kind of with the art and, and what that can look like? Sure. So I think in a lot of ways, when we look at artwork, it can it can initially make us feel a certain way, but I think what allows us to interpret it beyond just the initial aesthetic quality. So for example, looking at this photograph, um, you have of course your initial reactions to it, but learning more specifics into what it could mean will allow us to infer meaning and infer kind of further that emotional skill set and, and in a lot of ways, be able to unpack that empathy in a, in a different way. So um, to look at things like title, maybe time period of when the work was made, um, where the artist is coming from, all of these things, as Elizabeth had said, they're all um, adding to this, this layered story of, of how we can look at artwork in a way that helps us to, I mean, in reality, like understand each other better. I think that's what at least my goal is in, in unpacking and looking at this artwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of are getting at a little bit of, of sort of what we sort of, again, put together as far as ways that we might approach art. Like here is an initial framework of like, you, you want to leverage art to understand the world in a different way or understand patients or maybe understand society, but knowing how to approach it again can, can be a challenge. Knowing how to allow yourself to engage your emotions can be a challenge. So um, the framework we came up with is CAMEDO. That's our acronym, um, Context, Artist, Medium, any ethical implications or challenges that the artist might be surfacing, any duties that we might have um, as practitioners, as patients, as um, activists within our neighborhoods and communities, um, are engaging our empathy, um, and trying to see if we can if we can um, feel what the artist was feeling or, or feel the challenge that um, the person is surfacing, and then a worldview. What does this mean for how we're how we're seeing the world um, and how we're processing different uh, current events, different um, social situations that we might find ourselves in? So that's the framework. If you don't remember it, we're going to go over it a couple more times, but let's dive into it. Um, our first uh, our first point in this framework. Uh, is identifying context, understanding a work in context of its relationships. And a lot of times um, you'll find this on a little card if you're in an exhibit, um, or uh, you'll see it kind of underneath the work if you're just scrolling online, understanding the time period, what was going on in history, what were the cultural norms at that point? Um, is the title literal or figurative? Um, understanding the work is maybe part of the exhibit or part of the online curation. Um, how does it fit in with the, with the topic 
a hand. And, and one of the key things that I, I like to surface here is, you know, whenever I'm at a museum, I'm always on my phone, kind of <laughs> Googling, trying to find out what experts have said about a work or um, understanding what the artist wanted to say. And I think that's okay. But I think truly engaging with the work um, means staying present with it and not kind of falling into that trap of, of letting other people do the work around um, understanding for you. There's actually some really interesting kind of context clues we can surface from this work. Ramon, do you want to go into those? Sure. So with this specific piece, it's from the year 1856. And um, if you look at it a little bit closer, you'll see the um, what's, <laughs> well, first of all, the title is uh, a tooth drawer. So it's sort of indicating that this is a man of um, maybe dentistry at the time, and he's holding those tools behind his back. So uh, even if we don't know fully what's going on, we can kind of look at these initial clues as something that we can at least use to start thinking about what this piece could mean. And I think even before, um, before we get fully into it as well, I just wanna mention in unpacking all of this work as well, I think, to have an initial curiosity about what, um, what the work could mean and to not have a, a totally clear view of what the information is indicating, I think that's perfectly fine. And so to try not to judge yourself as, as we're going through this, to not know what it fully means is some, sometimes the point. So um, yeah, I think that that's a good place to start with this piece specifically. And if Elizabeth, you wanna go into maybe the, the more, medical background of the time. Yeah. Well, just, just, just as a context clues, again, not doing like a deep dive into the work, right? We see that whatever tool the, the dentist, if you will, is using is concealed behind um, his back. So that gives us kind of implications around truth telling, maybe around pain, possibly around um, the view of women at the time. So those are some context clues we can just immediately infer, um, you know, pulling this out from an exhibit. This obviously is curated in context of our slides, but um, just clues that we know from the time period um, and, and, and things we can infer just, just by having curiosity about what's going on in the piece. Um, I think our next point is recognizing the artist. Ramon, do you want to speak to this? Sure. So uh, when we're looking at artwork, obviously the, the product of what they made is so intertwined with the person who made it. And I think that's such an important piece because um, when we're looking, for example, at a, the work referenced previously, the person who made it is coming from a specific period of time, but they're also bringing their identity along with whatever it is they're making. So I think it's, it's really important to consider that every piece of artwork we're, we're seeing and we're experiencing ourselves isn't existing or being created in a vacuum. And I think the same is true even today when we're seeing, when we're seeing pieces in a museum or even seeing the work of Alicia, who was a tattooer, her work is being informed by or was informed by her own identity as, um, as a woman, as a person of color. All of these things go so far into the connection of what we ultimately see as the final piece of work. So I think that's a really important, if we go back to the, the came do acronym of being able to sort of um, piece together uh, these, these clues of artwork, the artists themselves is a super integral part of being able to allow us to inform the experience of understanding something because the, the artist behind the work has so much to do with what that piece of work means. That brings us to medium, which, which also is kind of intertwined with the artist as far as maybe their skill set, but also the message they're wanting to convey. Mm -hmm. So in this specific piece, we see, we see a work of neon, which can, you know, it has its own sort of indications of meaning in itself. So when you see neon, you're typically thinking about Las Vegas or a bar, you know, you're bringing into context what's typically used in, in a more flashy, dynamic, inviting way and bringing in this artist specifically, Patrick Martinez is bringing a different con conversation into, um, 
sort of into frame with with the materials and medium that he's using. So again, that that connects back to the artist as well because it it goes um, sort of connected into the way that the artist was trained. Um, but the medium is so connected to the meaning because it can make the work mean something totally different. For example, if we're looking at this piece of neon, how would that look if it were a painting instead, or if it were a sculpture that didn't light up, you know, how would that make us feel in, in uh, contrast to what and how the artist ultimately decided to present this piece? Um, that brings us to um, evaluating ethical implications of, you know, if an artist is taking the time to create something, it's because they had something to say. And often, um, whether it's social commentary or wellness or um, pain, right, th there are ethical implications for us in medicine, whether that's as clinicians or researchers or patients. Um, so I think that after, after we kind of examine these superficial sort of like, what can we draw from the work? What do we know about the artist or what can we, um, um, infer about the artist based on maybe like information that's presented with the work, we can get to evaluating the ethical implications of what challenge, dilemma, violation is the artist surfacing? Are they marking a moment in history? Are they advocating for things to be different? Um, we can ask ourselves questions about how the artist understands pain or healing. And, and in more contemporary art, there's a question of how does the artist perceive um, medicine or the healthcare system? And, and then also kind of going back to your point, Ramel, what does the work reveal that another medium might not? I love this series from Patricia Leigh Dorsey, My Caregivers and I, because I think it shows um, as we age, maybe our, our diminished um, ability to care for ourselves and, and, and what that can do to um, our self-image, what that means for our autonomy, but also that the, the relationships and the intimacy that emerges with one's caregivers. Um, so this is an exceptional series where, where it's it's very it's very um, I think I think this piece kind of hits us over the head with sort of the challenge um, that she's surfacing as far as her experience as a patient um, and her experience with the healthcare system. The next point that kind of ties into this is, is sort of duty. What does this mean for our roles? What does this mean for our roles as activists, as ethicists, as patients, as clinicians? How can I leverage? Um, this work to gain insight into medical history or current patient experiences. Um, and, and then that kind of ties in um, to this exercise of exploring an artistic practice um, and, and then using that to inform your empathy, um, kind of tying back to that original quote of, you know, even as we may have empathy burnout, um, how, how do we uh, allow a piece to, to hit us in such a place that, that it gives us expanded understanding, empathy, and, and maybe changes the way or advances the way that we see the world? And I think also considering it from an artist's perspective or point of view, you have so many artists in this, you know, industry in a way um, that as an artist, you feel connected to not just the things you want to preserve, but the things you feel. And so mm -hmm. I think having that be such an integral part of the job, in a sense, is a, a really amazing way to take into your own hands to be able to have this opportunity to look at work through that lens of like, considering maybe what, what the artist was feeling or what was going on at the time, it does speak directly to that, that level of empathy. Because I think so much of the work that artists are making are, is coming from a place of very extreme sensitivity to the world around them. Mm -hmm. I think that there's also this thing about, and, and you, you, know, you know, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but the power of visual art, uh, music, of dance, you know, as we age, even if, if our minds start to go, you know, you can often play a song or show a film to an older person and, and it brings back these feelings and these memories um, and this connection. So I, I do think if we allow ourselves and, it, you know, also kind of qualifying that you may not be moved by every work, maybe not every work resonates with you, um, but, but when we allow ourselves to um, dive into a work and kind of put on the way the artist is seeing the world and assess, you know, does it, what does it make me feel? Does it, does it make me feel nothing, something, big or small, many things, kind of taking a beat to really um, parse kind of what it makes you feel and, and what you can learn from it. Um, do you identify with what the, the artist is communicating? Um, I think within that 
too, like the, yeah. sorry, I didn't interrupt you. No, you're right. Uh, the idea of artwork in an aesthetic sense. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that art as a, as a practice and um, like a, a practice of looking at art doesn't necessarily have to mean that everything you look at is something you enjoy. And I think mm -hmm. that was a really big lesson for me in understanding how to um, sort of rewire my brain to, to think about things like what you're saying in, in, the, in the case of, um, you know, if, if the work is make me, making me feel small and it's not pleasant to look at, that's still okay. Um, because it's allowing me to understand where the, what the artist is trying to convey. And I think that's, that's an important paint, uh, point to make as well, because it's not necessarily all about having to enjoy aesthetically looking at something. It can help us to further understand the artist and also ourselves. So yeah. you know, not enjoy everything isn't necessarily a bad thing either. Well, and to your, you, you mentioned sometimes like, I, I, we have talked about this, that there, there was a particular set of work that where, where I felt, I, I felt the artist's feeling of smallness. And sometimes when you encounter a work, it can be very, very uncomfortable. It can be draining. It can um, evoke all manner of emotions and um, allowing for that and allowing time for that. And also allowing for maybe another person doesn't get that same reaction or a work may seem very, um, very neutral to you and, and it, it causes a reaction in, in someone else. I think that's like an important thing to note with this exploration as well. Right. Everyone's going to have their own understanding of the work they're looking at. And I think, right, it's just speaking to the idea that even if you go back and look at the same piece of artwork uh, years later, you're going to see different pieces of the work that resonate with you. And just, yeah, al allowing grace for that understanding is super important. Okay, um, let's do a quick review really fast. I know that that's kind of like a whirlwind. And again, these are just initial questions, kind of a, an initial framework of, of where you might start as you engage with art to surface um, different bioethical dilemmas um, or, or work to advance your empathetic skill set. Um, can you, once again, context artist medium, any ethical implications, parsing maybe what your duty is in a situation um, working to expand empathy and defining um, how a work um, changes or advances your worldview. So with that in mind, I'm thinking we dive into to some of our favorite works. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, this is a work by Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, untitled Portrait of Ross in LA, 1991. It's currently at the Art Institute of Chicago. And I'm, I'm gonna do a quick zoom in for us here. Um, if if y'all are having trouble making out what that is, it's, it's a pile of candy in the corner of a room. Ramel, can you kind of walk us through how we might leverage the framework? It, you know, if, if, if we were at an Art Institute of Chicago right now and seeing this work, how might we kind of begin an interaction with it? Sure, so I think the first thing that's super imposing is initially seeing the sculpture itself. So you have a pile of candy that is positioned very um, intentionally in a corner. So if we think about almost the contrast of those two, there's a, a really strong emotional sort of component of what happens just initially looking at something like this. You know, you have something that's very, very bright, but then you have it juxtaposed with something um, as confining as a corner. So I think that's that's the first thing that I would probably notice looking at a piece like this. And then of course you have the title card. So you're, um, you see Felix, Felix Gonzalez Torres, the work is made in 1991. Um, the title itself is Untitled Portrait of Ross in LA. And doing a little bit more research, a quick Google search even, you can um, discover that Ross was in fact his partner who passed away of AIDS. So the piece itself is a depiction of, of not just not just anyone, but a, a partner, you know, someone, someone so integral to life, especially for, for Torres. Um, and so to be able to look at this piece and what it means, I think the fact that it was an interactive piece as well is an interesting element of 
not just the preservation of the piece, but a way to see the piece itself disintegrate over time. And I think Elizabeth, you had said to the initial pile of candy that the museum had put in, in this place had started to rot as well. Yeah. Um, so of course it's abstract in nature, but to understand the context of what this piece is really about, someone, you know, someone's partner who had passed away tragically, um, looking at this candy, you can sort of infer the, the brightness at, of Ross or the way that uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres saw this person. Although in a, a very abstract way through candy, he's, he's explaining and articulating what this person meant to him. So I think that in, in uh, tandem with putting this work in a corner, we're sort of faced with a similar feeling of being in front of the work ourselves, we're watching the candy disappear one by one. Like, what, is, what does that feel like to witness, to watch? And on yeah. top of that, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. One of the, one of the things that I, I thought was so interesting is when this work was first presented, um, and even today, right, some people don't know that it's an actual work of art, that people will still go and reach for the candies and not recognize um, that, that that this is a depiction of something. And, and obviously he intended for that to happen, kind of a symbolism of yeah. right. what it's, it's, that uh, Within that same, that same feeling of, of like unseenness of mm -hmm. the, the patrons of the museum, the fact that similarly in these situations when someone so close to you is, is dying or passing away, I think that feeling is so similar in, in that abstract way where you might be going through something so severe, but the people around you might not know. So I think it, it the, this piece is a, is a really successful one in being able to convey that feeling and to, to really hold space for, uh, although this isn't something that everyone will experience, I think the artist does a really amazing job of being able to uh, at least try to convey what that intensity feels like? I think for me, when I look at this piece, um, and the first time I saw it, I didn't have any context other than like portrait of Ross. And I, to your point, I think like I surfaced that it's glittery and sparkly and, you know, kind of sugary. Um, and it, it made me want to see patience the way Gonzalez Torres saw his partner, to see to see people um, in the light that their, their partner might see them in. But I think it was also like kind of heartbreaking having the context of medical history about how patients in um, who were experiencing um, AIDS at that time were treated. The, the placement in the corner, I think, um, is just, it's just really, really telling of, of what they experienced as a couple. Gonzalez Torres also died really young, I think about 38. Um, so, so both he and his partner, um, you know, his partner passed, I think, I think late eighties, um, but, but that, that was how they felt, um, because of their care, um, in society and because of their care from the medical system. Um, and so for me, as far as expanding, like my empathetic skill set and my worldview, I, I think the thing I always come back to is, you know, I, I want to see patients the way, like, like again, Gonzalez Torres saw his partner. Um, do you have other thoughts on this one? Um, I think what comes to mind is the conversation we were having a little bit earlier of like, especially work in an abstract sense, it can be easy to look at something like this and, and be dismissive of it, which maybe is even something I would have done in the past. Like, oh, this, you know, you know, candy, what is it? Yeah. Doesn't do anything. And I think to, um, just like learn how to undo that judgment a little bit is a really good exercise. And, and this feels like a really good example of that in its own way, because I think it can, um, on the surface, maybe not mean anything to us, but as we've sort of gone into in depth, the, the piece is really significant and even heavy in a lot of ways. And so I think we, uh, we do ourselves a, a disservice by dismissing um, things that we don't understand. And, and a lot of times abstract work can 
fall criticism to that. So um, just keeping that in mind as we move through these slides and then we take this practice with you. Yeah, just a, again, it, it's a visual work. It, it, it acts as kind of a history marker. It, it um, challenges us to think. I know, I know a lot of people debate, you know, especially with contemporary art, what actually is art. Um, but I, I think this work is actually very, very meaningful um, for society. Um, let's transition over to our second piece that we wanted to take a look at. Um, an experiment of unusual opportunity produced in 2008. It's at the Met now, but I'll share. The first time I saw this piece was at the Frist in Nashville. And I remember not being able to make out what it, what it was or what it was about. Um, I, I actually, I'll show a close up here, had a lot of challenges even telling them what it was made with. Um, I, I think we know it is, um, it's a mixture of all manner of things. It's paint, it's graphite, it's charcoal. Um, but uh, the first time I saw this work, I, I felt very, very confused by what I was seeing. I felt like I was seeing um, uh, the ocean maybe like like there's this there's this feature on the far right side that kind of looks like a squid to me there's this feature that kind of looks like a jellyfish to me um but when I think about you know the depths of the ocean right it's <laughs> it's a place that's unexplored that that is often um I think very scary from from what I understand from my friends who do the scuba diving you never know quite know what you're going to encounter and you really don't go below a certain level. So I, I, that was kind of my first um, sort of taking in, you know, the medium. Um, there was a there was a feature about the artist next to the work, Ellen Gallagher. Um, I believe she's in her late forties now. Black woman grew up in the U.S. Um, and from the title, an experiment of unusual opportunity, I began to wonder if it was a commentary um, on research. So it was it was produced in two thousand eight, which I think. Um, gives us this sense of this, this was, this was valid and surfacing um, in 2008. Ramel, do, do you have any um, initial thoughts on this? Well, I think your own experience and first reaction and emotion tied into that moment of seeing this piece mm -hmm. says so much as well. And kind of what we talked about before vaguely um, in the sense of not being able to understand work out the gate. Uh, I think if you had made an enemy of the fact that you didn't understand exactly why you felt that way or you couldn't figure out what materials were there, it would have pushed you away from what the artist was actually trying to make you feel, which was actually, in a sense, like the artist was trying to push you into feeling that same feeling of confusion and uncertainty in so many ways. And so the fact that you were feeling that, I think, is a good indicator of... Um, just releasing that judgment from how you had initially felt, but using that as well as a way to help yourself understand what the work itself means and what it's about. So, you know, there's that. And then I think on top of that, thinking about the fact that this work was made in 2008 by a black woman, black woman in America, that's um, really powerful in itself to bring up these topics that are still so prevalent in our country today. I think is um, a really important thing to note as well. Yeah, so a quick Google of just the title of the work and the first thing that pops up is the work takes as its subject, the Tuskegee experiment. Um, and for our guests who aren't familiar with that, uh, starting in 1932, the US Public Health Service followed um, 600 black men suffering from late stage syphilis over the course of 40 years, um, performing treatments that were not treatments um, on these gentlemen and, and watching how it spread through uh, a community. So that, um, that confusion, that not quite being able to parse, you know, what's going on in the work um, as, a, as a commentary kind of on the deception and, and what it must have felt like to be a patient in society then, and maybe even for a lot of people, what it means to be a patient in society now of can we trust the medical system? Can we trust research? Like there, there, there's often um, motivations, whether those are, um, you know, in healthcare, right? Whether those are financial or um, uh, in research, like trying to trying to prove something, right? There are these motivations that can be really hard to see if you're if you're on the side of um, a patient. There can be a lot of opacity, I think, um, into the system. 
within these works too, I think it's important to note that a lot of the time these artists aren't necessarily coming to these even completed works with a sense of conclusion. They really don't, they're not trying to say all the time that they have the answers. It can be this curiosity of like, you know, is this system doing any better today than it was yeah. when this, for example, this trial was taking place in, in the 30s or starting in the 30s. Um, I think art can be a, a amazing way to pose questions to the viewer and to the audience of like, for me as an artist, this still, this still feels unresolved. How does it feel to you? It can be something as general as as asking those questions that bring us into deeper conversations about the state of the world or state of each other emotionally. I think it can be a really powerful tool in that way. And I, I think specifically with this work, right, as far as um, expanding our empathetic skill set, right, like understanding that this work was created to symbolize um, a period of history that that is still still relevant in 2008. It, you know, patients are still feeling this way. I think that that gives us an insight into into um, potentially how we as clinicians, right, can, can serve people better um, and what it must feel like when, when I see this painting and I know the confusion I feel and, and not um, the lack of understanding I feel, you know, my hope is that, that I, I never want a patient to feel that way in the healthcare system. And I know that in some ways it's going to happen, but hopefully um, kind of through the practice of ethics, right, not because of anything, um, it, if patients still feel that way, like we are working to address it in the healthcare system, I think is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, that hopefully we get to a point where, where this piece um, will, will not resonate with um, the experience of patients or, or what we know about the opacity um, of the medical system as a clinicians. I think the really interesting thing about using art as a way to inform these ideas or situations or emotions is even looking at these two artworks, these situations or um sort of like specific situations of um like medical care even aren't going to be something that all of us experience directly but by mm -hmm. understanding the work it allows us to have this lens into something we may not have been curious about in a certain way or may not have had a specific empathy towards so i think again it just speaks to that emotional skill set of um having empathy and caring uh, like holding space for the things that we don't quite fully understand yet. And, and to the extent um, you mentioned earlier about medium, right? Like there are lots of essays that are um, devastating to read about kind of this topic. Um, there's lots of written works, but there is something to the immersive experience of sitting and grappling with a work when you don't quite have all the answers and you're feeling the feelings that I think really does present us with an important tool for for um, coming to understanding, expanding our worldviews. Mm -hmm. I like that example we had we had talked about before coming on too of sort of imagining the difference between looking at this piece of artwork in front of us versus reading an essay on it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna gather different emotional ties to how something like that makes you feel. And um, even if it's something you can't quite explain, I think I think that's okay too. But like the sometimes the reason for making artwork isn't something that we can fully articulate, but the fact that we can't doesn't make it any less important or meaningful. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that in mind, um, we wanted to provide some resources. Uh, you know, we hope our guests do have um, access to museums um, or exhibitions, but we also know that a lot of our guests may not have time uh, to go to them or may not have good transportation or um, accessibility. So this was a resource that was curated by Johns Hopkins, um, Bedside Education in the Art of Medicine. And it was actually developed as a tool for clinicians to approach their patients to use kind of the shared experience of viewing art to gain better understanding of patients. I personally have found it really interesting um, to kind of go through the different works. They're all categorized in context of different concerns, whether those are social or clinical, um, and just to sort of process them myself. So if, if people have interest or curiosity in kind of taking uh, the framework um, in the immediate future and, and seeing what it means when you approach different works, which questions serve you, which emotions come up, uh, this can be a really interesting tool. It's free and it's really easy to uh, register. 
So once again, kind of circling back our final review on uh, these initial questions that we would encourage you to ask when interacting with the work, we're going to be looking at context, the artist, the medium as kind of our sort of superficial framing up uh, our understanding of the work, what sort of challenges or ethical implications are surfacing, what does this mean for um, our duty in medicine, again, as patients, as clinicians, as activists, as advocates, and then, and then how does it um, expand our, our empathetic skill set? What does it mean for how we see the world? These are, again, the questions that we would start with. So I think at this point, Ramel, if you're good with it, I think we can go ahead and take some questions. Yeah, I'm, I would love to hear some questions. Hi, Did how you doing? That was very fascinating. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, one from uh, Greg who asks, how do you differentiate between ethical implications from just simple meaning making in art? That's a really, um, that's a really fascinating question. I think that, um, As far as understanding uh, the meaning of a work, right? Because that that is a discipline of like people who study art um, and try to try to grasp and parse what the artist meant. I, I I do think within certain works though, there's often the meaning often surfaces um, a challenge or dilemma um, that that we're also kind of I think trying to get at when we engage in a work uh, with this lens, right? I think that. Um, you could, you could approach uh, a work of art, um, again, not necessarily with a lens to try and understand, um, you know, your duty or the bioethical implications of a work. You could simply be trying to understand uh, the meaning. Um, and I, I think that that's, a, that's a, a separate but important practice as well. Does that, does that answer the question, Ramel? Do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think... Um... You don't necessarily have to think about it as like a separation either. I think in mm -hmm. looking at a lot of work, sometimes that ethical component of what an, uh, an artist might be trying to say will come up and other times the work is speaking on um, something more of, of a more personal nature that doesn't exactly bring that into the forefront. So um, I think again, it goes back to the curiosity of what a work can mean. Sometimes you're gonna find work that does have that uh, meaning attached to it. And of course the works that we're presenting today are framed in that way, but not every every piece is going to have that component. And um, to allow those things to exist at the same time isn't necessarily a bad thing either. You know, it's all, all part of this, this layering approach to understanding and unpacking and to look at art in a dynamic way involves a multitude of perspectives. The, Reverend the Katz, if that didn't get, oh, sorry. Uh, Reverend Katz, if that didn't get to the heart of your question, feel free to chime in in the chat again um, or definitely send us an email. <laughs> that, that kind of flowed into a question I think we'll give to Romel is uh, from Kehan. I often hear that people have trouble with non representational mm -hmm. art. You know, why is it art even is the question that they might ask when they see something. You know, do you, do you think that we all need a level of art literacy? to be able to make connections between a non-representational piece and our experience with healthcare? You know, I think it definitely helps to have some level of literacy in that sense. But um, I think the most important thing really is to, again, release judgment from the fact that maybe looking at abstract work can be initially uncomfortable. As an artist myself, my realm is abstract work and abstract painting. So I have these conversations a lot with people that might see a piece and, and they'll tell me, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what this means. And I think that's a really enjoyable part of being able to talk to people about the work because you go from the viewer looking at the work, processing what it looks like straight into what it means rather than having this middle stage of like, oh, it's a house and there's this whole scene. You kind of eliminate the middle um, that middle portion of almost distracting from meaning. And, and that's just how I, I look at abstract work and being an abstract painter. So um, in the context of looking at abstract work and inferring what it could mean, I think, again, you're drawing from those context clues that we had included in this came do review. So again, the artist background, their identity is going to become that much more important when you're looking at works of abstract art. So the medium, how does that, how does that help to convey 
um, what the artist is trying to say. Where, uh, at what point in time are they making work? What, like, when were they alive? Are they a contemporary artist? I think when, when you look at abstract work, I think in some ways it can be very challenging, but I think that's also why I enjoy it is because it brings you into having to use those clues that much more um, to infer everything and even further what, what those ethical implications of, of the piece could carry. I like this comment from uh, Jasmine. I like using visual thinking strategies to build up meaning from non-representational work. Those can be useful tools to deploy as well um, in context of, of um, uh, making those connections between non-representational art and our experiences with healthcare. Question from Steve asking about, is there evidence that art for healing is beneficial for patient outcomes? That's a great question. I, uh, I don't have a lot of answers on that. I do think that um, there is a lot of data to suggest that, that when we use art as a tool, it helps us to understand a patient's uh, concerns and potentially helps us to ask different um, and more nuanced questions to patients. It increases um, clinicians' ability to observe. Um, so to the extent that I think those things would likely be tied in, in some cases to better outcomes and, and to better healing, um, I, I, I would, I would I would imagine that that is the case, but I don't have immediate resources um, on that. I could I could look into it. I think that's kind of what's interesting about that whole idea in the first place too, because uh, as an artist, you think about like the the role, at least for me in my own life, being an artist and having that be what I do for a living, like what my, what my life would look like without that. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of artists think about that as well, of like, you know, what, what, what would I do if I wasn't doing this? And like you had mentioned too, I think experiencing art, experiencing it in, in whatever form it comes, whether it's art or music or performance, there's not exactly a way to quantify the difference or like what exactly that could mean to you specific mm -hmm. to your own life. And I think that's almost what makes it have this power in itself. Like just because you can't quantify something, does that make it less meaningful? I don't know. I think that's a, a really interesting thing to think about. Especially as far as like mental health and well-being. Another another thought I just had was I think a lot of us hopefully have been doing um, important work around reducing disparities in healthcare. And I think the first the first step in that work is identifying where the problems are. And I think that art again gives us that really good um, that really good lens into where certain challenges may be. So as far as kind of like conditions of systems change, identifying different issues um, through art, I would imagine that that also might have an impact on patient outcomes and healing as well. There's a question to Ramel about just kind of the, the creative process uh, from Miriam. It's, do you start a piece of art with a clear intention or do you find the idea and the messaging developing as you work on it? So I think for me personally, of course, this answer is going to be different for every artist that you talk to, but my process is very meditative in a sense where I'll, I'll work on a piece and give it some time in between layers where um, I'm kind of working through it as I'm working through other things I'm going on mentally. And a lot of times I don't understand really what it's about until I'm done with it. Um, and often that comes from me through a title. The piece will remind me of something that is very directly related to what I'm going through my, in my life or in, uh, um, even in my career, what, I, what have you. But uh, for me personally, in my practice, it's often revealed closer to the end of like a series or, or making a body of work. So um, that's a great question though. I think it's uh, definitely something that's gonna be unique to every artist you talk to. So just keeping that in mind. Jasmine, who uh, is, is one of our colleagues at Children's Hospital asks, how do you compare the utility of art in healthcare settings when thinking about environment, like art on the wall and creating art? 
I love that question. Um, obviously, we focused on engaging with visual artworks, um, but I think creating art uh, can also be a really unique outlet for um, understanding and hope and healing, uh, either um, as a tool, maybe as a clinician to process different to process different emotions or to process what you're seeing, um, or as a patient to process kind of what you're going through um, or how it's making you feel. Uh, Ramel, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think the whole idea in itself speaks to this idea of environment, where when you're studying environments, um, they're very clearly related to how someone's going to experience that that situation. So I think you know it, it doesn't even end at art. I think you can think about architecture, you can think about design, and the way things are organized and structured to which it alters the way we experience something. So for example, if you think about something as plain as a, a black room, that's gonna feel much different than if the room is painted yellow. So something as simple as that can help us to lead that discussion into how does, how does something feel like a, a hospital hallway? How does that feel different being painted all white or all black versus if there's a mural going down the entire hallway? You know, I think just being able to con consider how it feels can help us to understand um, what kind of difference it makes. For That's something I, I love about Ann shoots is, is the environment, is the, is the art uh, all over, uh, you know, the UC Health Hospital, um, the different galleries on campus and how it um, takes the environment from maybe being um, a little bit more sterile and a little bit more foreign into something um, that, 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 that might remind you of your home or might remind you of uh, a landscape or, or might remind you of the mountains. Um, so as far as environment, right, I, I do think that there's a lot of utility as far as um, making people uh, feel comfortable, making people feel invited, making, feel like, making people feel like they belong um, as far as art on the wall, kind of to your point about environment, Ramel. I, wanna, I think that'll be kind of a good uh, segue for us to kind of thank you both for a really interesting, engaging uh, discussion here. and maybe opening our eyes and our hearts to things that we really didn't think about as much as maybe we should be thinking about. And hopefully just the start of, or uh, continuing down a road of exploration for everyone. So thank you both Lizzie and Romel for doing this. And I, I wanna give a plug also for coming attractions. Um, next Monday at noon, we have a, another arts and medicine event with Stephanie Strathdee who's a uh, Associate Dean of Global Health at uh, University of California, San Diego. And she wrote a book about her, her husband who contracted a, an antibiotic resistant superbug and became deathly ill. And she raced to find a treatment and turned to something called phage therapy, which treats viruses with bacteria. And her book, The Perfect Predator, as it will be discussed with John Sam at our Dean of Public Health next week. So that's something to, you'll be getting flyers about soon. But thank you very much again. And uh, we really appreciate it. The recording will be on our website uh, later in the day or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you all, take care.